So the outline today for the talk, we're going to start out with just talking about what a vernal pool is, the characteristics of vernal pools and what make them special. We'll then sort of segue into some natural history and ecology of vernal pool animals, primarily the amphibians, but also some about uh, some of the invertebrates. Um, and then we'll pause for some questions and then I'll give a brief demonstration of our vernal pool atlas for those who are, who are interested. All right, so what, what is a vernal pool? Well, one of, the, one of the main characteristics is that they're small, shallow, and isolated from permanent wetlands. And uh, so what do I mean by small and shallow? Well, let's look at some real data about the uh, size of vernal pools. So here, looking at the estimated size of, of uh, 574 vernal pools that were confirmed in Vermont. And uh, as you can see, the vast majority, uh, two thirds of the vernal pools visited were less than a 10th of an acre in size. So, so pretty small and, a, and, a, and about a quarter were between a 10th and a quarter of an acre. Not that they can't be larger. As you can see, there's a small percentage, uh, about 7% that were between a quarter and a half an acre and uh, and those and then a very small number that were larger than a half an acre, so fairly small. And how about depth? Depth, um, the biggest chunk of those visited pools were between a foot and two feet deep, 41 percent. And then the next big chunk was a little shallower, between six inches and 12 inches. So about 75 percent of the pools visited were less than two feet deep. Um, they can be deeper than that. Um, there's a you know a small percentage that were between two and three feet deep, and some that were over three feet deep. But between uh, uh, between six inches and 24 inches deep is about is very common. And they have the distinct seasonal hydrology because they're not connected to permanent wetlands for the most part. They're fed by surface runoff, just rain filling the pools and snow melt. They have a distinct seasonal hydrology where they dry in the summer and they fill in the, again, in the, usually they start to fill in the fall, they reach their maximum capacity in the early spring with snow melt and spring rains. But as the season progresses through the warmer months, the pool begins to shrink and, and dry out. And by midsummer, most pools are, are dry. Some pools may only dry in, in drought years or really dry years, um, uh, but they, they, it's important that they do dry occasionally because that inhibits fish populations from becoming established, which is really critical for the amphibians and invertebrates that, that depend on vernal pools for parts of their life cycle. Because they, uh, the amphibians in particular that depend on vernal pools don't have any natural defenses against uh, effective predators like fish. Um, amphibians that breed in permanent ponds like green frogs and bullfrogs and newts, um, their eggs and their larvae are toxic and fish quickly learn not to eat them. Uh, the, the amphibians that have evolved in temporary wetlands like vernal pools don't have those toxic defenses against um, predators like fish that are very effective and would wipe out all the tadpoles of wood frogs and salamanders. And in order for vernal pools to be um, successful for amphibian breeding, they have to remain flooded for at least three months after ice out. So if ice out is mid-April, um, they need to hold water until mid-July at the, at the very least um, for amphibians to be successful. And even that is a little bit of a short time for salamanders to be successful. It's fine for wood frogs, three months. Salamanders might need a little bit more than that. And to a certain extent, as you increase the hydro period, the length of time that a pool holds water, you also increase the species diversity that will be found in that pool to a certain extent. Once you reach a permanent 
pool, um, that species diversity is going to change because those amphibians that depend on temporary pools won't be as successful if there are fish populations, obviously. And what we don't know really is how, what are the effects of climate change going to be on this, this hydro period, which is so critical for, um, for vernal pools. You know, many climate models predict that we're going to have warmer, hotter, you know, drier summers. Uh, but another, another scenario is that we're going to have a more frequent, more intense storms. So if those intense storms happen at the right time of year, you know, in the uh, late spring and early summer and keep those pools flooded, that could have a good effect. If the storms come at a different time of year, um, then it could have a big effect on the, the length of time that pools hold water. And the last characteristic is just that these pools provide critical habitat for a suite of invertebrates and amphibians that have come to a depend upon these temporary type of wetlands. And it's one of the only ecosystems that I can think of that's really defined by its animal community rather than its plant community. So if you think of any other uh, natural communities um, in Vermont, they're, they're pretty much based on the plants that you find there, a black spruce bog, a red maple swamp, a lowland spruce fir forest, cattail marsh. They're all defined by the plants that you find there. There are no characteristic plants found in vernal pools. They're really defined by the, the unique animal community that uh, is found there. And ecologists these days have come to the realization that uh, vernal pools are really a keystone ecosystem. And that is they have a much greater influence on the surrounding forest than you would expect given their small size. Um, and a good example of another keystone ecosystem is a beaver wetland. And in fact, beavers are considered a keystone species because they create these wetlands. And in turn, those wetlands have a huge impact on the surrounding, the surrounding uh, communities. Uh, and the same thing for vernal pools. And one of the reasons they have a big influence on the surrounding forest is because of the, the energy flow, the amount of biomass that is coming out of a vernal pool. Even though they're only very small, a tenth of an acre or so, they can produce a huge amount of biomass. And um, one of our best examples comes from Brian Windmiller's PhD study at Tufts University back in the mid 90s, where he, as part of his PhD, he, um, he estimated the biomass of all the breeding birds, small mammals, and seven species of pool breeding amphibians in a 50 acre forest surrounding a vernal pool in Concord, Mass. And, uh, and he, he, again, these were just estimates. He didn't catch all the breeding birds and small mammals and weigh them. He just estimated what their biomass is in that 50 acre forest. And here's what he came up with. For breeding birds, just 13 pounds of breeding birds. Birds are pretty light, so that they don't weigh a whole lot. Small mammals, and if I recall, I believe he defines small mammals as squirrel size and smaller. There was 108 pounds of small mammals. And drum roll please, the amphibians, 271 pounds of amphibians coming out of, a, coming out of that vernal pool. More than the small mammals and birds combined. So a big influence. Um, and that, that transfer of energy from the aquatic system at the end of the summer when all those baby frogs and salamanders are leaving the pool. There's this huge transfer of energy from an aquatic system to the terrestrial system, the surrounding forest, provides a huge amount of prey for a wide variety of animals, from garter snakes to uh, raccoons that frequent vernal pools and other mammals like mink, um, to barred owls, here's a game camera by one of our vernal pool monitors set up at their, their pool that they monitor, and two, two barred owls were frequenting this pool. And in fact, barred owls are one of the most common predators I find at vernal pools. They really rely on them, particularly in the, in the spring. When the wood frogs are calling, it's, that's like the dinner bell for the barred owls. 
they hear the wood frogs calling in the pools and they immediately will show up. And I don't think it's any coincidence that barred owl eggs hatch right around the time that the wood frogs start breeding in mid-April or so. Um, so they have young to feed and there's an abundant food supply at these rural pools all throughout their, all throughout the forest. I'm gonna to go to this little video of a barred owl uh, hunting at a vernal pool in uh, Keene, New Hampshire. We'll catch a, we're gonna, I'm just gonna skip through a little bit to the, uh, to the good parts. Over several days, this barred owl was feeding at this vernal pool, um, mostly wandering around in the leaf litter and, uh, and catching, uh, catching salamanders. So here it is, and you'll, you'll watch it searching the leaf litter for uh, spotted salamanders. There he's got it in its beak. And it immediately uh, flies away with, the, with these prey items. So it's clearly going back to its nest to feed its young. And this is a period over two or three days, both night and day, it's, it's hunting at this vernal pool um, repeatedly and uh, catching mostly salamanders, although wood frogs are very common for them to, uh, to catch when they're, when they're present. <clears throat> so the animal communities that vernal pools support are really dependent on forests. Not that vernal pools can't occur in fields or, or open habitats, but when they do, the biological community in the pool is usually quite different and less diverse um, compared to those pools that are found in forests. Um, trees contribute to a pool's food web and also uh, help maintain uh, cooler water temperatures in the summer by shading the pool and uh, slowing down evaporation. And uh, trees contribute to a pool's food web by, by the annual input of leaves in the fall that fall into the pool and form the base of the food web. Um, the food web in a vernal pool is a, just detritus based. And those, those leaves that wind up in the bottom of the pool uh, are, are the base of the food chain. So species like caddisfly larva and isopods which are detritivores. They chew up the leaf litter at the bottom of the pool um, into smaller and smaller pieces, which helps fa facilitate the um, decomposition of that leaf litter because this, this is a low oxygen environment. The uh, decomposition doesn't happen as rapidly as it does in the far on the forest floor. Uh, and it also encourages the growth of paraphyton. Paraphyton is a, is a very nutrient rich source of food for a lot of species. And it's a sort of a, a very, it's kind of a fuzz that grows on the bottom of the pool on sticks in the pool. And it's made up of algae, bacteria, detritus and, and microbes. And it's uh, one of the primary food sources for wood frog tadpoles, as well as a lot of in, invertebrates as well. So that's primarily what the tadpoles will feed on is this, this nutrient rich fuzz that grows on the bottom of the pool called paraphyton. And one of the, uh, one of the important uh, invertebrate indicator species we find in vernal pools, or at least in some vernal pools, are fairy shrimp. Uh, this is the, uh, the knob-lipped fairy shrimp, Eubrancopus bundii, uh, one of the more common species in Vermont. Um, and these guys are really, really fascinating to find, kind of enigmatic. Uh, some pools you'll find them in and some pools you won't. Sometimes you'll go to back to a pool where you had fairy shrimp one year and they won't be there uh, the next year. Um, not that they're not still present, their eggs are probably present, but the conditions just weren't right for their eggs to hatch that particular year. They're really beautiful, graceful animals. They have a fairly short lifespan. They spend their entire life in a, in a single vernal pool. They have no um, physical uh, way of dispersing from one pool to another other than their, their eggs. Their eggs can be transported by the wind or by wildlife from one pool to another. But I know pools within 100 meters of each other 
where one pool has vernal pool, has fairy shrimp and the other one doesn't. So what exactly the conditions are that that are optimum for them, we really don't know too much about. Here's here's a map of pools we know have vernal pools. I mean, sorry, that have have fairy shrimp. And this is not an exhaustive study. This is just sort of opportunistically what pools have been reported to us that have con been confirmed to have fairy shrimp populations. So they're, they're widely distributed around the state, but we don't know much about which species are found where. It's not a highly diverse group here in the Northeast. We probably have just two or three species in Vermont. And here we'll see a little video of some fairy shrimp underwater take my little underwater camera and plunge it into a vernal pool and um, get to see the rich the rich life uh, in a vernal pool. So the orange the orange guys are the fairy shrimp. We're also seeing a lot of um, Daphnia and copepods, which are the small grayish, small grayish organisms you see in the water column. You can see how gracefully this fairy shrimp swim on their backs with these um, sort of swimming legs that also double as um, sort of function as gills. And the white tip tail is a good uh, diagnostic feature to uh, pick, pick out the fairy shrimp. They have this white forked tail. They can lay two different types of eggs. They lay what are called summer eggs um, that hatch very quickly. And then there are several uh, generations of fairy shrimp during the during the dry season or during the wet season. And then at the end of the summer or later in the spring, they'll lay what are called winter eggs, which sink to the bottom and can last for years and years um, and still be viable. But they have to go through a drying and a freezing before they'll before they'll hatch um, the following spring. So that probably accounts for why, for why some years there may be fairy shrimp in a pool and other years there may not. All right, well, let's move on to the amphibians, which is kind of my, my real area of specialty. I'm not, not so much an invertebrate specialist. Um, so we'll talk about the four species that are sort of in our area that are sort of the, the vernal pool um, indicator species or the species that are really more dependent on vernal pools than other types of wetlands. And these are from, the, from left to right, spotted salamander, blue spotted salamander, Jefferson salamander, and then the wood frog at the bottom. So we'll start off with the, uh, the poster child of the vernal pool conservation movement, the spotted salamander. Um, really engaging animal, pretty spectacular um, to see they can grow quite large, eight, 10 inches long is not unusual. They're very long lived. These guys can live 25 or 30 years and they continue to grow throughout their life. So they can get, <clears throat> they can get quite large. Six or eight inches is, is a little more typical, but I have seen them 10 inches or, or bigger. <clears throat> In the early spring, these guys will start to migrate to their, to their breeding pools. They overwinter in small mammal tunnels in the forest surrounding pools. But on the, on the warm, warm rainy nights when the temperature is above 40 degrees or so, and what really triggers them is the ground temperature. The ground temperature has to reach, um, uh, has to be uh, warmer than the air temperature in order for them to really start moving. Um, so it takes a little while. So the wood frogs are usually arrive at the pools before spotted salamanders. Um, but once they arrive, uh, the first thing they'll do, and we're going to jump to a video again, the, uh, typically the males will arrive first. And when the males arrive, they immediately go into these, these congresses, these groups of males that are just sort of these swarming masses of male salamanders waiting for the females to come and arrive. And when the females arrive, um, often a day or two later, or could be even longer than that, um, which is what we experienced this year. The males arrived first, but took a day or two longer for the females to arrive. The female will, 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 will come up to a Congress and seem to select a male and they'll move away from the Congress together. 
and then the male will deposit spermatophores on the bottom of the pool. And you can see some of them scattered around on the bottom of this pool. They look like little white flecks of paint or something. Um, and those are the uh, spermatophores that the male deposits. The female picks up those spermatophores with her uh, cloacal vent, and the eggs are then in, for, uh, fertilized internally. And a day or so later, she'll deposit her eggs, uh, usually attached to sticks or, or grasses on, uh, in the deeper parts of the pool. So here's a close-up of a spermatophore. Just consists of like a little jelly packet capped off with a with a capsule of sperm on the top. And again, the males will drop these on the bottom of the pool on the leaf litter or occasionally on a along a stick, uh, and the female will pick them up. And you'll see them in the, you know if you visit a pool at the right time of year, you'll see them scattered all over the pool. Here's what they would look like scattered around the bottom of a pool. This is what's left over from the previous night's orgy. Uh, spotted salamanders, sal these mole salamanders are all uh, primarily nocturnal, so they're, the breeding really takes place only at night. And during the day, they're just hidden underneath the leaf litter in, these, in the pools during the breeding season, and they're really difficult to find or see during the day. But if you come to a pool at night with a headlamp, um, it's, it's, it's quite spectacular to witness. So each female will lay between one and three egg masses, and each of those egg masses, which can be about the size of a baseball, contain between 30 and 250 embryos. So they have a pretty high reproductive output. And just for comparison, the Jefferson salamander lays these much smaller eggs, as you see on the bottom right of the screen, much smaller um, egg masses that might only contain between five and 30 embryos. So a little bit lower reproductive potential from the, from the Jefferson salamanders. And then after breeding, the males and females will leave the pools and disperse back into the surrounding forest uh, where they spend uh, most of the, uh, the rest of the year living in underground burrows, small mammal tunnels primarily. Um, occasionally they'll come out on rainy nights and forage above ground, but most of the time they stay uh, below ground where it's humid and uh, get and stay away from sunlight. <clears throat> Spotted salamander is widely distributed in the, in the eastern North America and it can be it doesn't only breed in vernal pools it will breed in beaver ponds and certain permanent types of wetlands that have uh, shallow areas that are protected from fish populations and areas with lots of cover lots of vegetation uh, that uh, inhibits large predatory fish. So they're pretty wide distribution in in the eastern North America. In Vermont, they're widespread as well, considered a medium priority species of greatest conservation need, primarily because of their dependence on vernal pools. So even though they can breed in beaver ponds and you know some shallow wetlands, they really have a Real heavy reliance on vernal pools. And if we lose vernal pools because they're so abundant on the landscape, we're going to start losing populations of spotted salamanders as well. All right, let's move on to this blue spotted and Jefferson, these two um, very interesting and closely related species. The blue spotted salamander is much smaller than the Jefferson. They're only four or five inches, much more slender. They have um, their North American range is the, nor the furthest north of any of the mole salamander species up into Ontario and Quebec and even up into Labrador. Um, and in Vermont, their stronghold is primarily the Champlain Valley. And these guys breed primarily in lowland wetland complexes. So, but they will use vernal pools as well. But they're much more common in these shallow, um, large wetlands like Cornwall Swamp or the Brandon Swamps some of these red maple swamps that are very extensive but shallow where fish populations don't occur. Um, the Jefferson salamander, on the other hand, on the, on the right, uh, has a much more limited distribution 
large percentage of its global population occurs in the Northeast. And its breeding is really primarily limited to vernal pools, and especially those that are sort of in the uplands, in the ridge, ridge tops. And there's some evidence that they're more sensitive to habitat fragmentation in some of the edges of their ranges. And here are their ranges in Vermont. Again, on the left is the blue spotted, on the right is the Jefferson. And um, the blue spotted is considered a medium priority species of greatest conservation need, while the Jefferson is a high priority, again, because of its really dependence on vernal pools. Um, blue spotted stronghold, again, is the Champlain Valley, with some populations in the Connecticut Valley, particularly in the south. Um, the Jefferson is also found in those areas, but it also has this real stronghold kind of here in the hills of the Connecticut Valley, the, in the upper valley area, um, as well as central Vermont. And uh, the really unusual thing with, with these guys is that, and what really fogs their uh, kind of clouds, our understanding of their distribution in Vermont is that there are these um, unisexual hybrid populations consisting of all females um, that are really complex. And um, I could spend a, a, a good 45 minute presentation just talking about this unique complex. Um, this is not something that's, a, the hybridization is not something that's occurring currently. This was a, a historic ancestral hybridization event that probably occurred between two and four million years ago between most likely, it appears that it occurred between the blue spotted salamander and a salamander called the streamside salamander. Um, and there, it resulted in these unisexual populations of all, that consist of all females, and they have a really unique way of, of uh, reproducing. It's called kleptogenesis, and uh, which basically, and it's called that because basically the females require sperm from the males, from males, from a pure populations of blue spotted or Jeffersons, but the sperm is not normally incorporated into the egg or the genetic material is not incorporated into the egg. It's just used to stimulate the egg to develop. And what can happen is that sometimes the genetic material is incorporated into the egg, but it's just, um, it's just, it's called genome replacement. So instead of actually fertilizing the egg, where you have one pair of chromosomes from the female and one from the male, it just adds an extra set of chromosomes. So you can have, instead of just having diploid populations like you have in normal sexual reproduction, you can have triploid, dip, or tetraploid. Um, you can have multiple sets of chromosomes from, from both species mixed up. And that's what we're seeing here. So the blue spotted at the top is a pure blue spotted salamander. On the right is a pure Jefferson. And then going down are, are, are some with different uh, genetic mixes. So some with blue spotted genes and some with Jefferson genes. Um, the ones on the bottom, uh, the one on the left at the bottom is two thirds blue spotted, one third Jefferson. The one on the bottom on the right is one third blue spotted and three quarters, sorry, one quarter blue spotted and three quarters Jefferson. So very complicated. Um, it's a really unique group that again, descended from this common ancestor that was probably um, the genetic information points to coming from a, the stream side salamander and the blue spotted salamander but it's it involves five different species of mole salamander that makes up this monophyletic group called the unisexual complex. So really fascinating, really complicated. Um, and uh, that's the blue spotted Jefferson complex. All right, let's move on to wood frog. Uh, very, very widely distributed in, in Vermont and in the Northeast, spends most of its life in forests, hence its name, the wood frog. Very wide distribution across uh, North America and the furthest north ranging frog 
that we have all the way up north of the Arctic Circle to the Arctic Ocean, which um, poses a challenge for overwintering and uh, and pulling off breeding in the short Arctic uh, summer. And the, and the wood frog, along with spring peepers and gray tree frogs and a few other frog species, have a pretty unique method of, of overwintering. Instead of overwintering in the bottom of ponds or underground, um, these guys freeze, freeze solid. I want to watch a short video um, from, uh, from Nova that, that will talk about, uh, if I can get it to go, that will, uh, I had this problem once before. All right, I'm gonna have to, well, we're gonna skip that for now because it's not uh, it's not loading. Sorry about that. But I can explain what 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 goes on with their um, with their over their overwintering strategy. Basically, what they do is they uh, as the weather gets colder, they they settle into just underneath the leaf litter, you know, just an inch or two of, uh, uh, below the surface of the forest floor. Um, and their body immediately, as the, just as it starts to freeze, their body immediately starts to dump glucose into its bloodstream, which then um, fills its cells with glucose, and that glucose acts like an antifreeze so that their cells don't burst. And it's a um, just a, a really unique strategy. They can thaw and refreeze multiple times during the winter and provides them with a really fascinating and uh, and a successful way of overwintering uh, and becoming quite and becoming active pretty early in the spring. As soon as they thaw out, it takes maybe 24 hours for them to regain function. They can immediately um, begin uh, their migration to, to vernal pools. So once out of vernal pool, um, you're probably quite familiar with this, but the, uh, the males will start chorusing. Sounds a little bit like, like quacking, <clears throat> quacking ducks. And the males are searching for females, and they're going to grab, grab anything that they think might be a female. Um, and occasionally they'll grab things that aren't even the right species, spotted salamanders, green frogs. Um, there was recently a, a post of a wood frog that had grabbed the head of a trout. Trout was seen swimming around with a wood frog attached to its face. So the, the males are, are pretty aggressive, um, searching for females to breed with. This is what they're, this is what they're going for. The females tend to be quite a bit bigger because they're carrying egg masses. The females are often this reddish color. The males are often brown like this. In the midsummer, they're both more typically a, a light tan that matches the uh, leaf litter quite closely. Females deposit their eggs uh, in um, often in these communal masses. And the females typically will lay one egg mass per female. Uh, but the egg, those egg masses swell up to be about softball size and contain a large number of eggs, between 800 and 2,000 eggs per female. And those, uh, those large communal masses provide some protection. Um, it, it increases uh, solar absorption so, they, so that they warm up and develop quicker. It also reduces predation, just because those eggs at the center of the mass are protected from predators and also protects them from temperature extremes, from freezing primarily. Here's a quick run through of how to identify um, some of the different egg masses that we've been talking about. So one thing, the first thing to know between salamanders and frogs is that salamander eggs on the left, is particularly look at the, at the spotted salamander at the bottom. Salamander eggs have a outer jelly coating or, or outer jelly matrix surrounding all of the eggs, whereas frog eggs on the lower right um, don't have that outer jelly um, matrix. The frog eggs are just, each embryo is encased in a little capsule of jelly, and then they're just sort of uh, a, 
uh, attached to each other um, by tension, by surface tension. So they look kind of, they have a very lumpy appearance. Um, but they can fall apart fairly easy if you pick them up out of the water. Spotted salamander eggs are quite firm. You can pick them up out of the water. Jefferson salamander eggs at the top, again, are much smaller, harder to see, and the jelly is quite loose. And, and uh, even though it has that outer jelly matrix, they're quite loose. Blue spotted salamander eggs are very difficult to find. They're usually laid singly or in small clusters of two or three eggs at a time and just attached or deposited on the leaf litter at the bottom of the pool. And then the egg masses from the unisexual Jefferson blue spotted complexes um, often have a high proportion of dead or unfertilized embryos, as you, as you see here, the whitish colored embryos give, are a giveaway that these are from a unisexual um, salamander complex. The other thing you might notice is that spotted salamander eggs will have a greenish tinge after they're in the pool for a week or two. They start to take on this, to grow this symbiotic algae that's actually been named after the spotted salamander because it's, it's uh, unique to the spotted salamander. And it's recently been found that not only does this algae grow on their eggs, but it's actually found inside the salamander cells. It's the only known case where a photosynthesizing algae is found in the cells of a vertebrate species. Um, really unique, really unusual. It's not known if the adult is passing that algae on to the egg mass or if the algae, it, it seems that the algae is growing from laboratory experiments. I guess it seems that the algae is actually colonizing the egg mass from the environment not being passed on, but um, still a really unique situation. <clears throat> so the, um, the eggs hatch, once the eggs hatch, we have uh, salamander larvae and wood frog tadpoles in the pools. Easy to separate between salamander larvae and tadpoles. Salamander larvae have the big feathery gills. Um, tadpoles have internal gills. Salamander larvae are predators feeding on a variety of invertebrates from Daphnia and copepods when they first hatch to larger things like fairy shrimp as they get larger. Um, wood frog tadpoles are primarily omnivorous, feeding mostly on vegetation and periphyton, but as they get larger, they may also eat some animal materials as well. Both of these suffer high mortality, so even though they're, you know, they're laying tremendous number of eggs, um, only any, anywhere from 30 to, or sorry, 10 to 30 percent of those eggs are actually going to survive to reach metamorphosis. Um, wood frog tadpoles will reach metamorphosis in about two months or a little bit over two months from the time they hatch, depending on water temperature. And the salamanders take a little bit longer, maybe three months or so. <clears throat> Once those uh, metamorphs leave the pool. They're highly, very vulnerable. Um, they can desiccate very quickly in, uh, in the sun or in windy conditions. So they're mostly staying under the leaf litter, particularly the salamanders. Uh, they disperse into the surrounding forest. Again, the salamanders, as I said earlier, are very long lived, 25 to 30 years, and they have a fairly long juvenile stage. They don't become sexually mature until they're three or four years old. So that juvenile period is when they disperse and will wander the landscape and disperse away from their breeding pool. As, as adults, they typically will, at least a proportion of the population, will breed in a, in a different pool from which they were born. If they all return to their natal pool, well, that would just be a, they would be inbreeding. There's no genetic um, dis, you know, gen, genetic dispersal between populations and they become very weak genetically. So there has to be dispersal between populations. And this is the stage that dispersal occurs, the, the juvenile stage. Wood frogs are much shorter lived. They might only live three or four years. Males can probably breed at one, maybe two years old. Females more likely they don't breed until they're two years old. And if females breed two or three times, that's probably a pretty long life for a wood frog. 
<clears throat> All right, I just want to mention two of our citizen science projects that we have um, at VCE. We have the Vermont Infernal Pool Atlas, which um, I'll describe and give a brief demonstration if you're interested after we take some questions. We also have the Vermont Vernal Pool Monitoring Project, or VPMON, which, um, which involves adopting a vernal pool and then visiting that vernal pool several times throughout the year to collect data. Um, so that's a fairly new project. This is its, uh, our, our third season, second full season of data collection. Um, and if you're interested in learning more about those projects, uh, visit our website, our Vernal Pool Conservation website to see see to learn some more so i'd be happy to take some uh, questions in a second i'll, I'll go we'll go back to this uh, to the vernal pool atlas and i'll give a brief demonstration of what what the atlas is um, but at this point um, i'm happy to take some some questions from the group if we um, if we have any hey steve it's kevin uh we got a couple questions from the chat um if mortality rates are similar, why do salamanders lay fewer eggs than wood frogs? <clears throat> yeah, good question. Um, it could be it could be that the mortality rate of wood frogs as metamorphs and as adults, and because they're shorter lived, um, that could be that could be an explanation for that. And obviously, um, wood frogs, um, because they're living on the forest floor. They're a little more vulnerable to predators than salamanders, which are living primarily underground. Salamanders also have um, some toxins, the adult salamanders in their tails primarily, that make them un unpalatable to some species, particularly mammals, will, um, will avoid eating some of the adult salamanders. Um, snakes, are, garter snakes are probably the primary predator of the adult salamanders. Uh, along with um, some raptors, hawks, and and barred owls, so maybe that's the uh, one of the explanations. Cool. Um, why do eggs have jelly on them? <clears throat> well, I think the jelly um, provides a some protection to them, pre prevents the eggs from from drying out, and provides some protection from predators. So if it was if, if the embryos were just you know naked, just laid bare in the in the pools, they would be a lot more vulnerable to predators. Not that some predators can't get through that jelly, they do, uh, but um, it does provide a certain amount of protection and uh, yeah. Um so someone had a bunch of eggs turn white after a below freezing night and they assumed that they had been killed off by the cold, but then they were just not fertilized to begin with? Um, yeah, it could have been, but yes, they will turn white when they freeze. <clears throat> when the, if the embryos die, they're often um, colonized very quickly by a fungus. And that's, that's the white you're seeing. Um, and if you were to look at it under a microscope, you'd see that it's really fuzzy it's obviously a fungus that's growing in there. Um, so that can happen either if it's unfertilized, the fungus will colonize or if it, or if it uh, freezes or dies from some other, from uh, some other reason. Thank you. Um, what do you think is the best indicator that a pool is a vernal pool? Well, you, you, you really have to use a combination of characteristics, both the physical characteristics they typically, as I said, they don't have permanent connection to groundwater, so they, they don't have a stream flowing in and a stream flowing out, at least not permanent streams. They can have, they can have temporary or ephemeral streams flowing in or out. So you have to look at kind of the physical characteristics and also what species are there. So are any of those indicator species? And for indicator species, we use those, those uh, uh, four, four amphibians that we talked about, spotted, blue spotted, and Jefferson salamanders and wood frogs. And then we also use fairy shrimp as an indicator species um, as well. Great. Um, I, I answered this one quickly, but I think it might be nice to elaborate a little bit more. Um, there are obviously more than just those three species of salamander in Vermont. So 
Uh, how come those are the ones you covered? Where do the other ones breed? Here's okay, great. Yeah, well, the other the other species we have are either um, stream salamanders. So there are three species of stream salamanders: the two-lined, the northern dusky, and the spring salamander. So they breed in streams. Um, then we have some. Then we have the redback salamander, which is a terrestrial species, and they don't breed in pools or in water at all. And then we have the four-toed salamander, which will breed in some vernal pools, but they more more commonly breed in um, in those large uh, shallow wetlands like Cornwall swamp or red maple swamps, those kind of things. Um, then we have the newt, red, the eastern newt, a red-spotted newt. They they breed primarily in permanent wetlands. They need a longer, a long hydro period for their for their uh, eggs and larvae to develop. I think that covers all the salamanders. Then we have the mud puppy, which is a species that is found in in Lake Champlain. Um, but I don't know. I, I don't think I missed any. I might have missed one, but. No, I think that covers most of them. Um, yeah. saw another. Uh, you didn't meet. You didn't mention spring peepers. How come? Uh, spring. So spring peepers will breed in vernal pools, but they're they, they're not dependent on vernal pools as much because they're mostly they'll breed in a wide variety of wetlands, cattail marshes, you know, the red maple swamps, all kinds of swamps and and other types of wetlands. In fact, they're most common in um, and most abundant in some of the big marshes and swamps. Um, they lay their, their eggs are really small. They lay their eggs singly, just in the leaf litter. So their eggs are really hard to find. Their tadpoles are really small and, um, <clears throat> and uh, stay in really shallow areas that are really thickly vegetated. So they can exist in, um, in wetlands with where there are fish populations. And um, well, they will breed in vernal pools. We don't consider them an indicator species because they're uh, they're not as dependent upon them as they are, as some of these other species. Cool. Um, one. Uh, so how uh, identifying leopard frog eggs and is it reasonable to see them in a vernal pool or another wetland? Leopard frogs, <clears throat> yeah, so we have two spotted frogs in Vermont. We have the leopard frog and we have the pickerel frog. Both of them are primarily um, permanent wetland breeders. So leopard frogs are mostly confined to the Champlain Valley, not entirely, but mostly that's that's their stronghold and they mostly breed in floodplain uh, type of wetlands, big, big wetlands uh, along some of the major rivers um, and uh, not really vernal pool breeders so much. Um, and they, these, they have defenses against fish predation. They have toxins in their in their in their eggs and their tadpoles, and same with pickerel frogs. They're they're primarily um, permanent pond breeders. I've been hearing pickerel frogs calling in the last couple of days um, from from my pond. Um, so they're yeah they're breeding in permanent ponds. Thank you. Cool. Um, I just had a couple more going up in the chat that I missed. Um, how come? So you mentioned the uh, spotted salamander eggs that have algae in them, but some are kind of like a milky, opaque white. Why is that? Okay. Yeah, the white egg masses that you see are um, just that the female has a has a different protein in the jelly, and that's just a genetic characteristic that that she has that she'll pass on to her her uh, female offspring, and they'll lay those same opaque white eggs. And it's just a different protein that makes up that outer jelly matrix. And there's Great. been a bunch of studies done looking at that. Is there any advantage or disadvantage to having that that different protein? And so far, all those studies have been inconclusive. They don't seem to have seen, haven't been able to see any advantage or disadvantage. Great, cool. Uh, I think maybe one more question, then we can go on to the VP Atlas presentation. Okay. Uh, demonstration. Um, I saw one more question uh, regarding artificial pools. Um, how could you go about creating a man-made pool? Is that possible or do they have to be naturally formed? <clears throat> yeah, well, the, there are some guidelines for creating artificial pools. Um, I, I don't, 
I don't typically encourage creating artificial pools. Um, the problem is sometimes it's it's hard to mimic the hydro period and get that right. Um, and if you, the, the, the main problem is if you create a pool that has too short of a hydro period, um, then you can create population sinks where the frogs and salamanders will find it and they'll lay eggs there. But if the pool doesn't hold water long enough, those eggs don't have a chance of don't have chance of surviving. Um, and the frogs don't know that. Um, they don't have any way of determining how long the pool is going to hold water for. So that's the biggest danger is creating a population sink where there's no success. The frogs think it's good, but it just doesn't hold water long enough. Awesome. Cool. Let's move on to the VP Atlas. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. So let's um, <clears throat> let's move on to uh, Vernal Pool, the Vernal Pool Atlas um, demonstration. Uh, we'll go here. Let's see. So to find the Vernal Pool Atlas, you can either go to the VCE website and go to projects and go to Vernal Pool Conservation under Forests. Scroll down to the second one, the Vernal Pool Atlas. Click on that. And then if you scroll down and see the map and just click on that map, it'll take you to vpatlas.org, the Vernal Pool Atlas. What this is is basically an online database of vernal pool locations in Vermont. And it's also an interactive um, tool where you can add um, locations of vernal pools that we don't know about or add data to existing pools that we do know about if you go out in the field and visit a pool. So the first time you visit the site, it'll take a little while for the map to load. And you'll see at the top, you'll see a menu of, of options. So what you can do is go to search pools and you'll get a full screen map of all the pools we know about. And then you can zoom in using the plus or minus signs here, or you can search using the categories on the left. So you can search if you know a pool ID and you want to go to it, you can enter that pool ID. You can search by a user, somebody, somebody who's registered and, and submitted data, or you can look for all rural pools in, in a particular town um, but basically, if you want to zoom in to a pool, you can zoom in, and and uh, the, the key is at the bottom right. So the yellowish pools are pools that are potential, that haven't been visited in the field yet. If they're purple and triangular, then they've been visited and confirmed in the field. So we have a couple here in Randolph that you can see that have been confirmed. If you hover over it, you'll see the a little bubble appears gives you the pool ID. This one's called New 50. And if you click on it, it gives you a little more data, it gives you the, the date it was confirmed and visited and who visited it. And then you could also click on the that hyperlink view visit number and, it, and it'll take you to that visit and show you some data. Um, so <clears throat> the other thing about this, um, about the site is you can um, also change the base map so if you go to the Esri imagery base map, it's great. This is great because it's taken in the spring before the leaves have come out on the on the trees, and um, it gives you the opportunity to see through to the ground, and so it's fairly easy to um, to find pools, um, in, particularly in hardwoods, because you can see the, the the ground before the leaves have come out and when the pools are full. So the other thing this website will allow you to do if you log in and register, and I'll log in right now. I'm going to use I'm going to use this this username to log in. Okay, now that I've logged in, <clears throat> um, this Add Pool Data menu appears, and this allows you to click on that and allows you to add pool information. So if you know about a pool in around where you live and you go to the map and it's not on the map, you can add it to the map. So let's have a just have a quick demonstration of how we do that. So basically at, you follow the prompts here where in, in red at the top it says please begin by selecting mapped or not mapped in 2A below. 
So here's 2A. This pool was mapped or this pool was not mapped. So if it's not on the map, it was not mapped. So we select that. Now the map has this blue uh, locator pin. So we can then zoom in. Let's just say, for example, the pool we know about happened to be in Rochester, Vermont, which is right over here. So we grab that pool, that pin, and we slide it over to Rochester here. And let's say it's over here by Bethel Mountain Road somewhere. And uh, then we zoom in. We got to get in closer so we can see exactly where it is. If you know where it is, let's just say you know it's right right by this intersection of this road right here. You can just put the pin there. And it does, you know, again, it helps if you go to the Esri imagery because you can see the ground. And if it happens to be in hardwoods, you might actually see the pool. And it auto fills the latitude and longitude for that point you put it on. And then, uh, and then you just say, Save. You might add some brief directions about where it is, you know, near the in intersection of those roads and maybe say something about the location. It's near the top of the hill or whatever. Uh, and then you can add, just click Save Pool. <clears throat> and then you need to click Save one more time. And now it's added the pool to that location as a potential pool. It's given it a name, new 446. And um, and if you have a photograph of the pool, you can then edit this and go to up. You can go to add pool photo right here, and you can find the photo on your computer and upload it, and you have a photo to the pool. And then, if you also have information, if you visited the pool and you have certain information, you can scroll to the next page add information about the landowner. If this pool's on your land or someone else's land that you have permission to visit, you can add that information. Then you can continue on and add information about the pool, physical characteristics about the pool, size, depth, and, and eventually you can add information about indicator species and add photos of each of those species you might have found. And that information will then be archived in this database and um, really help us to um, to uh, conserve vernal pools in the long run uh, by uh, locating where they are. Because vernal pools that are on this map and are confirmed with indicator species are automatically considered class two wetlands and are therefore protected under the Vermont's wetland rules, just like any other class two wetland. So if there are any questions about VP Atlas, um, I'd be happy to answer them. Otherwise, I hope you'll um, explore that a little bit. And um, if you're interested, become a registered, uh, you know, register on VP Atlas and with a username and a password, and then you'll be able to add uh, add pools to the map. So thanks, thanks very much. If there's any questions, I'd be happy to take them. Uh, cool. So, Steve, from a technical perspective, uh, how is ad pool data um, like uh, incorporated or linked to the map? Well, so, it's, <clears throat> the ad so the the data are are added to the map and added to the database. Um, and as you see, the, the as was I added that pool, it was considered a potential pool. If you then go in and add data um, about the pool that provides that it's got the right physical characteristics and and has at least one of the indicator species, um, those data are then reviewed through um, through a sort of a quality control process by um, an administrator, myself or someone uh, possibly Kevin or someone at Fish and Wildlife can review those data and confirm whether that's actually a vernal pool, whether we have enough information to say, yeah, that's definitely a pool, then it could become confirmed on the map as opposed to just potential. Uh, but as soon as someone adds a pin to a location, it's added to the database, at least as a potential pool. Cool. Um, do you need landowner permission to record on Atlas? 
<clears throat> you you need landowner permission for the pool to be, become confirmed. So if you put a pool on someone else's land, you know, pin a pool on the map that's on someone else's land and you don't have permission, and even if you add physical characteristics of that pool and add information about indicator species, um, it will stay as a probable pool. Um, it won't become confirmed uh, unless we have landowner permission. Cool. Um, there's a couple questions, uh, not necessarily about the vernal pool, but amphibians in general. Um, mm -hmm. So I had people talking about like rescue missions. So say you, there's a, a roadside ditch or a pool that dries out really early that you see eggs uh, late in year after year and they never make it. Yeah. Uh, I guess like the the science or the ethics or whatever between behind taking those eggs and moving them to a better location. <clears throat> yeah. Um that's certainly uh, yeah, that's that's a that's a good question. Um, I usually don't do that personally. Um, uh, I, uh, but I don't think there's any. I don't think there's a big issue with with transporting eggs. Other than I, mean, I guess the main concern would be um, transporting diseases. There are some amphibian diseases that you can move from you know one site to another. Uh, rotavirus, chytrid fungus. That's probably the biggest reason not to move eggs is that you could perhaps that roadside ditch might have uh, rotavirus present. And if you move those eggs to a, to a functioning, successful vernal pool, you might be introducing that disease to a vernal pool that doesn't have it currently. So that's probably the best reason not to do it. Mm -hmm. One more. Um, why any reason that a pool may attract, why one pool might attract wood frogs and salamanders and the nearby one wouldn't? <clears throat> yeah, it's a good, that's a good question. I've seen that occasionally. I usually attribute it to hydro period. If a pool is, has a shorter hydro period, uh, maybe over time. Hey, Daddy. Um, are you the, uh, the the adult uh, amphibians that have what I didn't mention during the presentation is that the adults once they start breeding in a pool they have very strong very strong site fidelity to that pool so um, they usually will return to it to the same pool year after year um, so maybe just over time uh, if the pool has a very short hydro period they will learn that um, it's not a successful pool, but um, I don't. I, I don't have a good explanation for that. Cool. Any uh, any last minute questions about anything that we covered, or no, any of the Atlas stuff, or anything? Anyone? Great. Thanks for helping out, Kevin. Thanks for attending, everybody. Feel free to give me a shout by email if you have additional questions. Thanks so much.